This video was sponsored by Rusty Quill's The Magnus Archives, the podcast that puts the occult in cult following. There's a concept in media as old as Roman theater called the stock episode, which is basically an episode of a series where the whole premise is based on a highly specific recurring trope. For instance, many series have the Die Hard episode, where the hero's base is compromised by bad guys and they have to sneak through events. Or the Egg Baby episode, where a character has to take care of an egg or a flour sack like it's a baby. Or the Color Coded Copies episode, where one character is split into two or more versions of themselves, sometimes but not always with different personalities. These stock episodes are usually hilariously specific and are often full episode parodies or homages to other popular media, like the Die Hard episode, the Gremlins parody episode where a cute pet turns into a monster when you void the warranty, the Fantastic Voyage episode, etc. Now like all tropes, stock episodes run the risk of becoming boring with overexposure. But stock episodes can also provide a fun opportunity for characterization. If the audience is already familiar with the scenario, it can still be fun to see characters we know and like react to it and play it out. The immense popularity of alternate universe fanfic demonstrates that pretty handily. So does every holodeck episode of The Next Generation. If we already like the cast, we're gonna like seeing them play out a familiar plot, and it almost does doesn't matter what that plot is. Some stock episodes also let the characters show off a little by putting them in scenarios they generally don't deal with. For instance, it's a pretty common stock episode for one of the characters to get sick and need help, and we get to see how the rest of the cast handle that, which can be fun and heartwarming. Or there's the stock episode where some of the cast ends up stuck in an enclosed space, like a cave-in or a broken elevator, and we see how they deal with that kind of stress and ticking clock. Now there's one kind of stock episode that really leans into that potential, and it's the greatest fear episode. In this stock episode, our heroes are forced to confront their greatest fears, usually by way of some kind of psychic attack or manic Manifest Nightmare. The Greatest Fear episode is a one-two punch of character development. First it tells us what the character fears most, which is a juicy bit of characterization, and then it shows them confronted, which is a cool badass thing for them to do. It also makes an easy Halloween episode if you're running low on ideas. That joke was funnier when I had this episode planned for October. Now the Greatest Fear episode has two key components. One, it shows at least one of our heroes' greatest fears. And two, it shows at least one of our heroes overcome it. These episodes are frequently named something like Nothing to Fear or Fear Itself, and the name is pretty on the nose. The moral of this episode is always that fear is just a passing thing and the hero can overcome it or work through it. This plot has a lot going for it, but its number one benefit is that it reveals an otherwise hidden core element of the character. People tend to mostly define characters by their core motivation, which is basically what the character moves towards over the course of the story. But it's equally effective characterization to show us what they're running away from. Their character motivation is a positive drive that gives us an insight into their priorities and goals, but if you show us what repels them, it accomplishes the same thing in reverse. A character might be motivated by vengeance and grit, but if their greatest fear is something like losing their new family, family, that gives us an insight that deepens their character in a surprisingly heartwarming way. Their stated motivation is revenge, but the thing that they'll fight hardest to stop is losing their loved ones. Or maybe the sweet happy-go-lucky character has like a really dark and scarring greatest fear, showing us that there's some very unhappy hidden depths under the friendly facade. They move towards happiness and fun, but they're running from something very unpleasant. This can also add depth to characters who maybe have kind of vague motivations, like superheroes who generally fight for generic good ends without much in the way of personal motivation. But that hero might fear losing control of their abilities and destroying everything they've tried to protect, or having the last of their humanity stripped away and becoming something cold and alien, or even just fear itself if they're afraid of losing emotional control. These fears are both concerning and very personal. A generic motivation can be counterbalanced by this kind of personal fear. And more than just a motivation, fear itself is a very interesting concept to explore. Fear is primal, overwhelming, and very difficult to resist. Fearlessness is seen as an admirable trait, but most people agree that a healthy degree of fear is useful to avoid being reckless. Some people are ashamed of fear and try to deny being afraid and the Greatest Fear episode often ends up confronting that head-on. A character needs to acknowledge their own fear in order to overcome it. But some stories aren't so kind. Sometimes, instead of the person overcoming the fear, the fear wins instead. This is popular in horror stories like today's sponsor, The Magnus Archives. In this kind of horror, fear isn't just an emotion. It's a powerful, malevolent force that you feed by fearing it, and the things it can do to you when it's strengthened are, appropriately, terrifying. But more on that later. For now, let's stick to more light-hearted Greatest Fears. Now, while I think the Greatest Fear reveal can be great for character development, it doesn't always get used that way. Sometimes the greatest fear reveal just reinforces already established motivations, like if the hero wants to stop the bad guy's evil plan, their greatest fear might be failing to do that and seeing the villain wreak havoc instead. Or the hero trying to save the world has the greatest fear that they can't. This is just kind of a reiteration of their original motivation, but more glass half empty. I want to accomplish goal A, and my greatest fear is that I won't be able to accomplish goal A. That's fine, but it's not all that revelatory. And sometimes the greatest fear reveal is played more like a joke. This is more common with characters whose greatest fears are like normal phobias. One of our heroes is wrestling with the existential terror that they'll never be strong enough to protect their loved ones, and meanwhile, the other one is scared of clowns. It's just kind of weak. It doesn't give us character insight, it just makes them seem silly. And sometimes that's the point. It's not uncommon for the big strong character to turn out to be afraid of ghosts or bugs or something, which is mostly like, eh, not so tough now, are ya? But it doesn't quite hit that same emotional depth as a really good greatest fear. Every character has a nucleus of 
core character traits. Like if you have to do an elevator pitch to explain them in three sentences or less, these are the things you include first. Let's do a quick example with Superman. Superman is a paragon hero who believes in upholding truth and justice using his godlike power as responsibly as he can. He's considered an ideal of heroism and hope, and in most versions he doesn't kill because on some level he worries that crossing that line will make it too easy for him to start crossing every line. Despite his godlike power making it kind of unnecessary for him to maintain his Clark Kent secret identity, Superman's humanity is extremely important to him because there are too many ways he could lose it. This is one way to quickly summarize some key elements of Superman's character. We've got a base personality, a general motivation, a role he plays in his story and world, a few principles he holds himself to, etc. These are foundational character qualities. Character dynamics, later developments, episodic motivations, surface-level personality traits, those are just the icing. This is the real base the character is built on, and the greatest fear is a base trait that often goes overlooked. Now, while I've suggested that the greatest fear is kind of an equal and opposite to the character's stated motivation, that's not entirely true. The greatest fear's equal and opposite is the heart's desire. It's what the character wants more than anything, regardless of realism or attainability. And rather like the greatest fear, the character might not even know what it is. Most characters don't really introspect that much, and they can often end up blindsided by their own greatest fear or desire. The character whose motivation is to save the world over and over again might actually want a quiet domestic life with their loved ones. The character seeking dark, self-destructive vengeance might just want to be reunited with the people they lost, etc, etc. While a character is aware of their own motivation so they can actively pursue it, these are aspects of their character they might not even know about. And that brings us to another strength of this trope, introspection inducement. See, most people don't really know themselves very well. Sure, they have an ego and a self-image, but it's naturally very biased by how they want to see themselves and how they've been taught to see themselves, because that's just how people work. And anyone else's image of this person is also going to be biased by that observer's individual worldview and relationship to them. There's really no such thing as an objective image of anyone's character. The way someone describes themselves can sound pretty unfamiliar to anyone who knows that person, because their respective images are biased in different ways and thus don't line up. And what the person thinks their priorities or noteworthy traits are don't always line up with what they actually are. Some of the kindest, most compassionate people I know think they're absolute messes who are constantly hurting people. And I've known some real jerks who can't decide if they're the victim in every situation or the second coming of Christ. There's always a disparity, and it takes a lot of introspection to really get any sort of feel for how you work and what your fundamental priorities are, rather than who you think you're supposed to be. But you know what'd make that introspection easier? If some dream-weaving nightmare beast manifested in your house and dumped you into a hallucination that flat out told you what your actual greatest fear was. This is the kind of thing that forces a character to introspect. See, characters differ from real people in one key way. They're a lot less complicated, and the audience generally has a pretty clear view of who they actually are. Now, just like with real people, everyone's interpretation of the character is going to be biased in its own unique way. And sometimes you might look at someone's fanfic version or lengthy think piece and wonder if you even watched the same show because the character they saw and the character you saw seem to have nothing in common. But all that aside, a character's core nature is usually pretty visible. While real people can be nearly infinitely complex, a fictional character is usually built from a small handful of simple and obvious traits. And because it's easy for an audience to get a read on these characters, it's it's also easy for us to see when they're in denial about themselves. The annoying Lancer character who acts like they're the hero, the well-meaning protagonist who's using the greater good as a justification to self-destructively spiral, the villain who is convinced that they're the good guy. We want these characters to introspect so they can actually get a clue and stop self-destructing, or just get some comeuppance, which can be fun too. So this is one of many tropes that involves a character confronting a part of themselves they might not like or even know about. This is great for character development. It shows the audience a side of this character they might not have seen, and it also shows the character that side of themselves, which can help them introspect and develop, or if they're a villain, it can help them appealingly self-destruct. Broadly, it's really good for adding depth to a character by adding a new dimension to the fundamental core traits. Of course, the premise of this episode is inherently kind of contrived. Characters don't tend to volunteer their core character concepts, and if they don't already know their greatest fear, how are we supposed to see it? This is where the episode's antagonist comes in. See, there's a staple villain archetype, the living nightmare. These dudes specialize in leveraging the fear of their victims. Maybe they can physically manifest nightmares, maybe they just have an intuitive psychic understanding of what'll scare their enemy most, but the most common version of this character has the simple ability to force their victims into their worst nightmare by way of a coma, a hallucination, etc. This version is popular because, among other things, it kind of protects the status quo. Your hero is just stuck in a bad dream. Lots of really nasty things can happen in that dream, but all they have to do to fix it is to wake up. A nice, clean wind condition with none of the cleanup that a real physical nightmare would involve. And with the status quo sufficiently insulated, the writer is free to put their character through the absolute ringer. And that's good for the audience because it's very dramatic. It's not good for the character, but you know, that's not really the point. That's not to say these stories are stakes-free. Sometimes if you die in the dream, you die for real, or the hallucinated nightmare can actually hurt you as long as you think it's real. The purpose of this stock episode is character exploration and drama, and you can't really have drama without some kind of stakes, even just emotional ones. But honestly, the stakes are usually the same. If they don't overcome their fear, with or without help, they'll be trapped in the nightmare until they die. Pretty standard, pretty simple. These episodes don't carry themselves on the threat of death, it's just the infrastructure to justify focusing on
focusing on the nightmare itself. Defeat the nightmare to not die. Not dying is the goal, so defeating the nightmare is the thing we get invested in. And that justifies spending the entire rest of the episode firmly in the character development zone. By the way, this isn't the only way to frame this kind of episode. In fact, some of them explicitly hide the framing. If the audience doesn't know it's a nightmare from the get-go, the show can instead show us some really crazy status quo-breaking events, like major character deaths or plot twists, leaving the audience going all, what? Huh? What? As we watch everything spiral out of control, until the character either jolts awake and realizes it was all a dream, or we cut to an outside perspective where we see their concerned loved ones expositing how, if the character doesn't wake up from whatever horrible nightmare they're experiencing, they'll die. Different order of operations, same result. We spend most of the episode in the nightmare zone, watching how the characters handle this unprecedented turn of events. Since that's the meat of this plot, that's where we point the camera. So we've got our stakes set, and we've got our focus character confronting their greatest fear in some kind of battle in the center of the mind. How does this go? Well, it varies a lot from character to character. This part is a lot less formulaic than the framing sequence. There's an episode of Justice League that I think is worth highlighting here because it covers a lot of ground for this trope in one convenient place. The two-parter episode is called Only a Dream, and the premise is that some rando gets dream powers, starts calling himself Dr. Destiny, and decides to live out his life's ambition of defeating the Justice League by trapping them all in nightmares, the stress from which will eventually kill them. Superman, Green Lantern, Flash, and Hawkgirl are all trapped in nightmares, while Batman and the Martian Manhunter are still awake but have to find a way to help them before it's too late. Wonder Woman is on vacation or something. I don't know, she's not in this episode. So Batman runs off to hunt down Dr. Destiny while stoically struggling with the fact that he hasn't slept in like three days, because of course he hasn't, and Jean attempts to psychically help out his trapped teammates despite the risk of getting trapped in their dreams himself. So those two are racing the clock and showing some pretty commendable badassery, but meanwhile the four sleeping leaguers are getting some dramatic character insights. For instance, the Flash's nightmare starts off kinda silly. He's watching himself on TV with a crew of rambunctious youngsters, in line with his goofy, childlike personality. The dream takes a slight turn when the kids all grow sharp teeth and try to eat him, but he's the Flash, he outruns them. Except that's the trick. In his dream, he can't slow down. The world freezes around him and loses all its color, and the funny, gregarious Flash faces the possibility that he's going to live out the rest of his life surrounded by people but completely alone, trapped by his own super speed. Possibly more alarming, Flash happily mentions that he's been having this dream ever since he got his powers. So not only is this his greatest fear, it's always on his mind. The happy, chipper Flash is constantly afraid of getting stuck in high gear. The only difference is this time, thanks to Dr. Destiny, he can't wake up. So Flash isn't having a good time, but what about the others? Well, Superman is having a lovely dream where he's on a date with Lois, except then his heat vision switches on and burns a hole in his menu. Uh-oh, wacky hijinks, Superman is always having to hide his powers from Lois. Except this time, he also burns up Lois. Well, that's not fun. Throughout the dream, all of his powers start growing exponentially, and his uncontrollable strength accidentally kills Jimmy Olsen. On screen! Superman's greatest fear is that since he started with no powers and his current powers are already incredibly strong, will he eventually reach the point where he can't control them at all? And if that happens, will he end up killing everyone and everything he's tried to protect? Superman already feels like he lives in a world made of cardboard. Could he handle a world made of wet tissue paper? Meanwhile, Green Lantern's nightmare is a little more existential. He's back in his home neighborhood, but everyone seems scared of him. And when they talk, he can't understand them. Even the billboards and signs are incomprehensible. He's become something alien and unfamiliar without even noticing. I mean, he is bonded to an alien energy source, it's a reasonable anxiety for him to have. The Green Lantern energy even physically burns through his body. He's clearly afraid that his alien power might be eating away at his humanity, that becoming a vessel for this kind of power means he's no longer himself. Compared to that, Hawkgirl's nightmare is almost basic. She's extremely claustrophobic, so she just ends up stuck in a coffin and buried alive. I mean, it's scary, but it's not very revelatory. But there's actually a narrative reason for that. See, this happens early on in season two, and it's not until the season finale that we actually learn anything about Hawkgirl's backstory and true motivation, and they're massive spoilers. So at this point in the story, showing us anything deeper about her characterization would risk blowing that reveal early. Plus, the simple fear works quite well in context because Hawkgirl has demonstrated herself to be a very badass brawler, and at the beginning of this very episode pulls a seriously fearless move when one of the bad guys grabs her and orders her to fly him up out of the fight or he'll kill her. Instead, she flies him 400 feet straight up and tells him if he makes good on his threat, he'll drop 40 stories. She doesn't care at all. With this kind of stoic, unblinking badassery as our context for her character, the fact that something as simple as claustrophobia can scare her this much is revelatory all on its own. Everyone's afraid of something. She's not scared of her own abilities or a general existential dread. The only thing that really scares her is so basic and primal she can't do anything about it. In a way, it's a basic fear that's not very revelatory, but from another perspective, the simplicity of the fear is very revelatory. Hawkgirl is a very simple character. Uh, sort of. And even though they end up getting some psychic help, the characters still overcome their fears individually. Jean asks Superman to trust him to help, which cuts to the heart of his fear. Superman was afraid he was unstoppable just because he couldn't stop himself, and sometimes he needs to 
to be reminded that he's on a team. Jean reminds Green Lantern that the ring chose him because of who he was, and thus it's his tool, not the other way around. And Lantern dives into the power source to get the boost he needs to kick the bad guy out of his head. And for Flash, he just tells him to look within, which helps Flash calm down enough to listen to his own racing heartbeat and gradually slow it down. Jean just provides a sanity check and some moral support. Everyone still overcomes their own fear, except for Hawkgirl because her brain has psychic shielding. So everyone's fears reveal something interesting about their character. And it's also interesting to note that the two characters who we don't see the fears of, Batman and Martian Manhunter, are the ones whose fears are already established. Jean's easiest phobia is his vulnerability to fire, and his fears are mostly about how he lost his family and his entire planet. Batman is… well, Batman. Fear is kind of his thing. I mean, he deals with Scarecrow on like a bi-weekly basis. We don't need to see their darkest fears to understand their deal. Instead, we get to see other facets of their characters. Jean subverts his own general stoicism and demonstrates his deep compassion for his teammates by risking everything to save them from their nightmares. And Batman gets to show off his unrelenting determination by powering through an extremely sleep-deprived worknight to track down the bad guy in question and keep him out of his head through sheer force of will. All in all, a fantastic showcase of everyone's characters to a level of depth we don't often see. Well, except Wonder Woman. Seriously, what was up with that? This is the kind of fun fun character exploration we can get from this kind of episode. We see the characters vulnerable in a way they don't generally deal with, and we get to see how they handle that. Or we make jokes about clown phobias for an episode. I don't know, man. It's always disappointing to me when this trope doesn't get leveraged. In fact, it's not just disappointing. The most common other way for this episode to go is that a hitherto unmentioned phobia is suddenly brought up as belonging to one of the protagonists, and the rest of the cast usually kind of roasts them for it. And when that happens, the audience is usually directed to sympathize with the roasters, not the roasty, because haha, who's afraid of clowns? Or bugs. Now, the inherently cruel nature of mocking someone's deep-seated phobia aside, this very specifically takes us out of the character's head. Instead of empathizing, we're meant to see them from an outside perspective where their fear looks ridiculous or funny. But since the main strength of this trope is deep, introspective character insight, putting us firmly outside the character's head for the purposes of pointing and laughing is sidestepping the entire benefit of this episode structure. And even if we see the character heroically overcome their fear, that victory is kind of diminished by the fact that we were supposed to think the fear was silly anyway. So a character's greatest fear can be great for character development, and beyond this basic episode, Episode structure, the core of this trope can be used in tons of contexts. Sometimes characters psychically travel into another character's mind and get that sweet character development directly by physically looking at their core character traits, or a circumstance seems disproportionately upsetting to a character because it taps into their deepest fear without directly stating it, and instead it's gradually revealed through subtler context clues or character dynamics. The greatest fear is a great facet of character development. This episode format is just the simplest way to explore it. So yeah, thanks again to Rusty Quill for sponsoring this video. Rusty Quill's The Magnus Archives is a multi-award winning weekly horror fiction and Anthology podcast examining what horrors lurk in the archives of the Magnus Institute, an organization dedicated to researching the esoteric and weird. New head archivist Jonathan Sims attempts to bring a neglected collection of supernatural statements up to date with audio recordings and follow-up research by his team, and finds that the individually spooky statements begin coming together to paint a very alarming bigger picture. Each episode and statement taps into one or more primal fears and explores its manifestation in a series of uncomfortably realistic personal anecdotes from assorted hapless victims, some of whom even survived. The Magnus Archives primarily focuses on the nature of fear and what it does to the people consumed by it, and builds from an episodic anthology series into an epic, grand-scale plot that covers a lot of ground without ever losing that episodic Monster of the Week thing I love. As he charged, he howled a terrible battle cry, and just for a moment, I could have sworn that I saw him cast a shadow that was not his own. The podcast is currently in its final season, and it's a doozy, so if you'd like to check it out and catch up, you can find the link to their site in the description, as well as their YouTube channel.